Hi everyone and welcome to my channel where I talk about movies including an occasional director series and I'm right in the middle of a short little three film mini series on the films of David Cronenberg of the 1980s. I started with Videodrome, it was my last uh, video and uh, uh, the next one will be The Fly uh, and this middle one, the one I'm going to talk about today is The Dead Zone. This is from 1983 based on a Stephen King novel uh, starring Christopher Walken in really one of his uh, most memorable performances. He's playing uh, a man named John Smith. He's sort of uh, every man. He is uh, a teacher in a small town in New England. He suffers uh, a, a brain injury from a horrible uh, uh, car accident where he runs into a, uh, into a tractor trailer. Um, he's in a coma for five years. He wakes up. He's lost five years of his life, but he's been left with an ability of a sort of paranormal ability to uh, have visions when he touches, uh, he, he touches another person's hand. Um, and these visions can be things of the past, the present, the future. Um, so this is a very much uh, a Christopher Walken, Walken playing an everyman. Now he doesn't often play everyman <laughs> uh, type characters. Here he's just fantastic at underplaying uh, the intonations of his lines, uh, his body language, his eyes. He's really acting with his eyes here. And it's, it's very much uh, an intimate love story. Uh, now, Cronenberg's films, I've often accused him, and not just me, but many critics, that his films are too cold, they're too clinical, but not so here. This is, this is a very warm film. Uh, it's a love story. This is, I think, Cronenberg's first love story, and the love story, outside of the paranormal uh, 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 events of the film, it's, it's basically a love story between uh, Johnny and his lost love, played by Brooke Adams, and what chemistry they have here, these two actors. They had just appeared on, in, uh, in uh, a play together, a George Bernard Shaw play, but they knew each other from the seventh grade. They were in the same performing arts uh, school in New York City. Uh, so this is a film on Lake uh, th this is a new uh, new avenue for David Cronenberg uh, to to, uh, to to travel on his uh, uh, in, in his filmography because uh, this is a film very much driven by character and relationship performance. Uh, Cronenberg is great at at uh, at the performances that he's able to get out of some very great actors, and there's a whole bunch of them here. Uh, uh, including Herbert Lom, who plays uh, the doctor who tries to heal, uh, bring bring Johnny back to health um, after this terrible uh, uh, traumatic incident. Tom Skerritt playing a local police officer. There's a, uh, a slasher serial killer type uh, uh, person on the le uh, killer on the loose. Uh, and he's stumped, and uh, Johnny's uh, ability is, has become famous uh, through some of the visions that he has seen. Anthony Zerbe, always, <laughs> always welcome in any film, uh, playing a uh, father concerned about his child who, um, who hires uh, Johnny to, to tutor him uh, because Johnny had been a teacher before his, uh, and uh, he has gained a reputation post Post coma, of uh, being a very, uh, very good teacher of children. Um, you get Colleen Dewhurst. <laughs> I missed her in the credits. I had seen this film since 1983, so what's that? 40 years. Uh, she, they only had her for a day, and <laughs> and she's just she's fantastic in this in this single scene, a scene that that is the one mostly I think most audiences will associate with, with uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Just a, a great scene. Uh, it's in the book, but I think Cronenberg actually makes it uh, a little bit better. Um, so this is Cronenberg in the mainstream. He had been a uh, director of non-union, very low budget uh, horror films with, with ideas. There was something special about Cronenberg. Uh, he gives you a lot of 
body horror gore, but he also gives you lots of philosophical ideas that uh, you wouldn't normally get in a, in a horror film. So he's got Dino De Laurentiis as his executive producer, um, and Deborah Hill as, as his as his producer. Now Deborah Hill was had been uh, had done a lot, a lot of films, and especially with John Carpenter. In fact, she also produced The Fisher King, which I talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, so there's no body horror here, but of course there is body damage in, in the brain damage. Um, and and we do get one very gruesome scene that you might I mean it's a real jolt of a scene, um, but that's pretty much it as far as as what you connect to to, to previous Cronenberg um, uh, films. And he particularly wanted to get away from that and try something different. He also was an admirer of Stephen King's novels. He thought eventually I will be doing a Stephen King. Um, uh, adaptation, uh, other directors, I think Stanley Donan was actually uh, uh, originally uh, ticketed to, to direct this film. Um, but, and this is the, uh, so, so also this is the first time it's not from his own screenplay. It's just Jeffrey Bohm wrote the screenplay. Now there was many, many different iterations of the screenplay, <laughs> many different versions. Uh, and in fact, they used other screenwriters and then they came back to Jeffrey Bohm again. So basically though, it was, it's described as Bohm and Deborah Hill was a very creative producer and, and, and Cronenberg sitting down and, and going through each scene. Um, and, and, and they come up with some, some great ideas and, and some of them weren't even in, the, uh, in, in any of the screenplays. Now, they changed the focus of the novel. And I did read the novel. This is the first Stephen King novel I've ever read. It was the first hardcover Stephen King novel to hit the New York Times bestseller list, but he was a phenomenon. There had already been films made, including Carrie from his novels. There were many more that were in production, probably too many by Stephen King's uh, own admission. There were, he, he was coming to the, to, he, there were too many adaptations being made at one time. But the, the novel, is sort of alternate uh, storylines. Uh, so uh, the, the, the subjects of the visions, we get to see a lot of their story. And then we can, can't come back to Johnny. Now, uh, the, the film it focuses entirely on Johnny. And uh, we, we get to feel what he feels. And, um, and, the, and they, made, uh, they made several changes, but the ending is in particular the ending is just absolutely inspired, and it was not in any version of the screenplay. And they, 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 uh, it, it came to Cronenberg uh, on on the set as they were about to film the ending, and uh, so they changed it around. And it really, I mean, it, the proverbial, it tied the film together and 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 and, and gave it a lot more gravitas. Uh, the ending than Stephen King's ending. Um, Although it's otherwise similar to, to King's ending, and when King uh, saw the film, he said, boy, <laughs> I wish I had thought about this aspect of the ending because it really does work well. So the novel is also heavy on the political. And it's a bit dated, and it's uh, when Johnny wakes up, he wants to know all about the political, you know, uh, um, uh, especially in the presidential level. Um, and, and it does involve, uh, the, the climax involves a vision concerning a very dangerous populist uh, <laughs> uh, politician uh, who might rise to being president and uh, played by Martin Sheen. And this is, again, Martin Sheen really uh, pulls out, playing a president uh, very much unlike the just the opposite of the president in, uh, in, in the West Wing. And, and, and King has said in recent interviews that he, he, was, he has been struck by the politician that he, this populist politician sort of worshiped by, by his uh, followers, uh, that there was, there was, <laughs> there was, there might've been some, uh, uh, it, it, some uh, echoes of that in, uh, in some recent uh, political uh, figures uh, of, of recent years. So, uh, now there's three commentaries on that. This is a really terrific, this is Shout Factory, it's from a few years ago, I guess uh, around 2017, it has three commentaries, it has some other supplements as well. Um, 
and uh, one and, and uh, God help me, I, I listened to all three of them. <laughs> one is one is very much attuned to uh, comparing the movie to the novel and the various uh, screen adaptations and different different uh, drafts of the of the of the screenplay. Uh, another one is uh, much more about the polit uh, about the historical, uh, 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 the, the behind the scenes uh, context of of the film, uh, with uh, with two two uh, gentlemen and one had actually worked on some Stephen King adaptations uh, subsequent to this, so he was uh, he's very much an expert on Stephen King, um, and. Uh, but, and then the other one is with the uh, cinematographer uh, Mark Irwin, and he's just fantastic. Now he was also he did a commentary with David Cronenberg on Videodrome, and they do mention in the commentary that uh, David Cronenberg was unavailable to do a commentary on the Dead Zone because he was working on Crimes of the Future, his 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 latest film. But Mark Irwin is just. A, I mean, <laughs> he just uh, provides so much great information and stories. He's, he's very articulate. Uh, they, they were looking, Cronenberg wanted to get a sort of Norman Rockwell look to the film, uh, very much um, a New England look. But this is not New England. <laughs> One of the reasons that I, wanted, I, I ended up watching all three of these commentaries was because it was actually filmed in a small town in Ontario, about 30 miles north of uh, Niagara Falls, called Niagara-on-the-Lake. Now, in 1983, I had never been to that town, so I would not even have known it, but I didn't recognize it myself in my unobservant uh, eyes, or I just get so involved in the story when I'm watching a movie. But I've been to Niagara and the Lake 10, 12 times uh, in the past uh, 20 years. And uh, they, it is one of the great small towns in, uh, that I've ever encountered. It's just absolutely gorgeous little small town right on the shores of Lake Ontario at the mouth or where the uh, Ni uh, Niagara River flows into Lake Ontario. And you can look across the river to a, uh, what is it, Fort George. Uh, on the other side, uh, a very, very significant area uh, during the War of 1812. So a lot of British, uh, or a lot of British uh, sympathizers in the U.S., in New York, New York State, this is, uh, came to, um, uh, came to uh, settle in, in, uh, in Niagara, Niagara on the Lake. Uh, so there are some very great historical uh, 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 houses and buildings and uh, so most of the film, not all of it, but most of the film is filmed in Niagara, Niagara on the Lake and they, everything is filmed on location. I think they only use the set in a couple scenes. Uh, so we get the interiors as well as the, as the exteriors. The, these are real interiors. I always love that in a film. I think it, it gains, uh, the film gains so much authenticity when they use the um, when they use the uh, 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 non-set interiors. Uh, so, but when I watched it with the commentaries and I looked, I said, my God, how could I not have noticed that? The Niagara and the Lake, not only is a beautiful small town, but they also have a, uh, coincidentally, a George Bernard Shaw uh, theater festival. It's one of the great theater festivals uh, considered to be uh, one of the great theater festivals in the world. So I just loved it. In fact, the gazebo, they build a gazebo for a very crucial scene on the part that overlooks um, where the Niagara River flows into Lake Ontario. And that gazebo is still there. Now they have actually rebuilt it because they, they built this gazebo um, for the film. It wasn't meant to last, but, and, then the t and they were gonna destroy it. The town said, no, we wanna keep it. And it's become a landmark because even though I didn't realize the dead zone uh, was filmed in Niagara and the Lake, I've been in that park many, many times, and I guess, according to the commentaries, many people come there to, to walk around that gazebo because of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, you know, the dead zone was filmed there. And evidently, Niagara and the Lake has been used in many other films uh, subsequent to this. I think this is the first time they used that, that town for it. It's certainly a great film set. So that's the dead zone. Uh, really, uh, 
a terrific, a, a well-crafted movie with great performances, especially by Christopher Walken. If you're a Christopher Walken fan, this is this is definitely uh, this is definitely one of his his finest uh, roles, I believe. Now, next up will be The Fly. Now, The Fly, I guess, is out of print, and I ordered it from Amazon, but uh, in my uh, <laughs> in, in my obtuseness, I actually order the 1958 version of David Hedison, which I haven't seen in a long time. So we're going to get a double dose of The Fly. I'm going to talk about this film, and I'm going to talk about the, the uh, I think it's 20th Century Fox's uh, release of The Fly, uh, which I believe is out of print. At least I couldn't find a, uh, a new copy that wasn't very expensive, and even the, the used copies are going very expensive. But... My library, which has, which is a small library a couple blocks from where I live, uh, it's a small library, but it's got a giant uh, DVD section. They don't do Blu-rays, but they do DVD. So hopefully this, the, hopefully this DVD will play. <laughs> you never know when you get stuff from the library. So that'll be next uh, on this mini series on the films of David Cronenberg. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody. Listen, I do appreciate it. Comments are always welcome. Take care.